Yes. Everybody got notes? Okay. All right. You have an important, have an important decision to make tonight. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You know, there was, there was you know, a little comment or two about, you know, when we've been at this a while. Um, we can finish up next week or we can go into the two weeks. We can wrap it up next week if I squeeze a little bit. Uh, Daniel said, since you've been such a great class, oh. you, can, you, you can have the option of finishing a week early if you want. <laughs> How, how does he know we've been good? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's probably We're, someone in here that calls him and tells him. Well, it's, it's on camera. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. We're recording. It's on video. <laughs> do you guys want to wrap it up next week? That's good. No. Yeah. I got yeah. one no. <laughs> I vote yes. I got a lot of yeses. <laughs> I don't right. really know You're going to get two sets of notes. Don't worry. Should we'll, sure we'll say no? So, no, I did not say no. <laughs> I didn't vote because I told you they win it tonight. I couldn't make that decision. <laughs> Forgive her for being late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. All right, well, I, I will uh, do a little surgery and we'll condense and we'll wrap up next week. What would you rather do? Well, I, I think we can do it next week. Um, but you have you have a little uh, homework assignment. Uh oh. Uh oh. So what? I want you to think this week about what are the five theme, major themes of the book. You know, three or five major themes of the book that you take away from the book, and what is the one thing that you're going to do based on what you've learned in Ecclesiastes? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with God's word? Enjoy life. Okay, be more specific. I want you to be kind of specific. Go ahead. Gotta be specific. All right, so everybody got notes for this week? Okay. Five major themes. All right, so um, let me uh, do a little bit of introduction here tonight, and then we'll pray and dive into the word here. So, this is lesson 13 for Ecclesiastes, and I titled this Seize the Moment. Seize the moment. And we're going to start in uh, chapter 11. We're going to do the first 10 verses. And do you remember our, our chiasm structure, this poet, poetic structure that I'm using to interpret the book? So there's an introduction, and then we brevity of life, passage about time, and we got to the middle of the book, and we talked about all the ways to fear God in this, <coughs> in this land of absurdity and vanity. Now we're working our way back, and he, the book, the structure repeats itself. So we're going to, we talked about brevity of life back here. Well, tonight this, we're going to talk about brevity of life. That's why we're going to talk about season and moment. And then next week we'll wrap it up you know, with the rest of chapter, uh, well, basically chapter twelve. Uh, we'll wrap up next week. So um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll uh, talk kind of get started on this. Bless the Lord, we honor you tonight. Thank you for your great word. May you've given your word to the, all the generations that have come before us. And you've given your word to the generations that will come after us. We thank you that your word's eternal. Help us to hear your word. <coughs> Holy Spirit, help us illumine your word that we might understand. <coughs> and embolden us, Lord, to seize the moment seize the opportunities that you're putting before us. Help us, Lord, to have an urgency to grasp the things you want us to grasp. Forgive us of our sins tonight. Forgive us of our disobedient hearts, our lazy hearts. We thank you for your great word now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. Um, well, kind of a, kind of a, you know, just almost like I always do, I kind of just march through the notes. So some of the key things that we've talked about your time on under the sun is short. Death is certain. Life is full of uncertainty. Last week we talked about all the different, all kinds of different uncertainty and, and the idea of managing risk. We're going to talk, hit some of those again this week. And mo a lot of the reason why, why there's so much uncertainty and unpredictability 
is because of the madness of sin and the rebellion under the sun uh, that's going on all around us. Madness and vanity. So, uh, it, you know, all along the way, the preachers told us, you know, to enjoy this short, uncertain life and to find contentment in the lot that God's given us. And so, at, you know, think back to last week. We talked about dead flies in the perfume, right? Just a little bit of, uh, of foolishness ruins a whole bunch of stuff. And we talked about the snake that's there when you punch through the wall. And we talked about the, the pit that's there that you don't want to fall into. All this unpredictability. So, you've got all this unpredictability and risk. So, it's the right answer just to pretty much lay in bed and pull the covers over your head. <laughs> sometimes. 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 Yeah. Or, or is it to live boldly? Okay. Well, the preacher tonight is going to tell us it's to live boldly. That that's the response of faith. The response of faith is to live boldly under the sun. In spite of all the madness, the unpredictability, all the injustice, all the oppression, all the things that don't make sense, we've talked about all these weeks, and he's going to tell us to live boldly. And, you know, I, I told you from the beginning that, you know, I see this book as a call to faith. And so that's what he's talking about tonight, is in faith, to live boldly, and to seize the opportunities that God puts in front of you. And uh, this, this idea of a lot in life, we talked about that a couple of times as we marched through the book. Your lot in life includes the opportunities that God puts in front of you. That's part of our lot in life, or the things that God, God brings in front of our path. To, to, to do something with, to, 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 uh, to intervene with, to be part of. So the message tonight is to enjoy our lot in life, right? He, he said, enjoy your, enjoy your life, enjoy your life. Well, part of that enjoyment is to seize those opportunities that God puts in front of us. That's, that's the, the real message tonight. So fearing the Lord... It's not just going in a cave and rolling a rock in front of the cave and hiding out. Or going in the bed and pulling the covers over your head. It's, it's living boldly. That's, that's the point. Now, caveat, what did we talk about last week? All this uncertainty, what, what, the, what was wise living? What did he do with all that uncertainty? Remember last week? Come on. <laughs> You, the fear of the Lord means you know those risks and you mitigate those risks. You know, we talked about knowing the, you know, knowing the risk and understanding the risk and um, knowing what you can't predict and knowing what you can see, that, those sorts of things. He's going to talk about risk mitigation some more tonight. Well, see? There were certain steps we were supposed to kind of follow last week when we discussed it. In other words, uh, the one was... Don't be foolish about what you're doing, and don't be spouting. It said, "Don't be talking in your bedroom." Yeah, kind yeah. of thing. One of one of the things was to watch your mouth, right? But that 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 increases risk, right? A lot of silly things we end up saying because they don't stay with whoever we're talking to. They come around, right? Uh, so that was one of the, that was one of the ways you mitigate risk in an absurd world. Well, he's so he's talking about there's risk and there's the right things we do to manage that risk, but to live boldly, not just to pull the covers over your head, but to seize the moment that God puts in front of you know that God puts you in. We only live here a short time, right? Seize the moment, but as you do that, you're going to do it with wisdom. You're not just going to blindly jump off the cliff, you know, kind of a thing. He's going to talk some more about risk management tonight, about doing things with wisdom as you seize the moment here. Uh, and these opportunities he's talking about tonight, it's not just money. The, 
the context, he's going to use examples financially. He's going to talk kind of in financial terms. But the opportunities he's talking about are not just money. We, we take risk, right, when we invest money. But you invest your time. You invest your expertise. You invest relationships. And all of these are part of seizing the moment. It's not, I, I just want to make sure that you think of that about this. Think about it in a big sense. It's not just investing money. But he's using that as, as kind of the example tonight, because we all understand uh, investment decisions and things. Okay? Any, any questions so far? Okay, this is going to be funner than funner. more fun. We're funner. waiting. It's going to be funner. All right. We're waiting. Okay. Now, he, does, he doesn't have as many. He doesn't have as many good proverbs tonight as he had last week. No, no, no dead flies in the perfume. All right, so let's look at this, and we'll read Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6. So here we go. And you guys have heard this a lot of times. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. <laughs> he who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Verse 6, sow your seed in the morning, and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. Okay. You want to ready to take, take off on this? So what in the world does he mean, verse 1? Cast your bread on the water. Feed the ducks. <laughs> Feed the ducks. Feed the ducks. Okay. Be generous. Be generous. Now, generosity is one of the themes of this. Uh, that, that, thank you. Uh, generosity is going to be one of the themes that we're going to bring out of this. Casting your bread on the water. If you remember back in, in um, First Chronicles, I believe, where Solomon's reign is described, and he had a navy. And he had this navy going all over the world. And they were trading, it talks about how he's trading in commodities and they're bringing back all these, you know, monkeys and all these exotic animals and all these luxury goods and everything. So casting your bread on the water is this idea of wheat being put on a ship and you're sending that ship off uh, as an investment. Okay. Now, I, I, I Anybody who's had anything to do with navies or, uh, or uh, a merchant marine or anything like that? Okay. So when you put a lot, of our, a lot of our ideas about insurance and these kinds of things, these financial instruments came out of shipping. Because when a merchant would load up, he'd hire a ship and he'd load up a cargo and he'd send it off. And he didn't know if it was going to sink because of a storm or where the pirates were going to get it, or whether it was going to be a mutiny on the ship, or whether it was going to get to its destination, and they'd make whoever was on the ship would make a good deal and come back with all kinds of riches for them. You know, a lot of, a lot of the Renaissance and all the art and all the things that came out of the Renaissance was financed by the, the trade with the Middle East and the spices and all that stuff. Because And the, and the money came from rich merchants who were shipping things. Okay. Well, that's what this is talking about. Cast your bread on the waters. Put your wheat out on the ships. Because if you don't, if you don't send them out, you'll never, you can't make a deal. <coughs> if you don't put the wheat, the ship on the water and send it off, there's no money to be made. There's no, if you don't take risk, there's no money to be made. Cast your bread on the waters, for you will find it after many days. Now, how, um, it, it, you know a little of your history, when these sailing ships would go, you know, all over the world, 
How long did it take for some of these journeys? Years. 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 So like the, like the American history, the whaling ships, you know, on New England stuff. They leave New England and they'd go around uh, South America and they'd be hunting whales out in the Pacific. And after they got the blubber boiled down, they'd come back all that way to trade the oil. Take two or three years, maybe. So all that time, the merchant who put up the capital to finance that ship, he doesn't know what the return is on his investment. Just, I'm just using this as an example. So we don't always know when we take a risk, we make an investment, it could be years or a long time perhaps before we understand if we've made any money on the deal. Okay, so it's not instantaneous, right? We all want instantaneous gratification, right? I'm gonna you know, buy something and tomorrow it doubles and you're gonna make a, a, a lot of money or something, okay? So they're saying take, you gotta take risk. And the risk involves time as much as capital. I'm, you know, again, I'm using economic capital as kind of a, of a, a proxy for everything that we've got to invest, okay? Cast your bread on the surface of the waters where you will find it after many days. Yeah, you know, this, this is kind of like the, um, when the kids are playing baseball, right? If you don't swing, what are your chances of getting on base? Okay? Or if you're playing basketball, if you don't shoot the ball, what are your chances of making a point? You gotta take risk. Are you gonna hit it every time? No. Do some of the ships sink? The, you know, the, the grain ships, if you will? Yeah, yeah, the archeologists have found some of them, right? Some of the, you know, they found some of these ships from Roman times that have gone down and they were just full of cargo. A very expensive cargo and stuff. And you, and you think about well, somebody was on the shore waiting for that ship and it didn't come in, right? But it's all, I lived all my life in the Mississippi Delta where cotton okay. was king. And you lived from, hey, if you got too much rain, you didn't get too much rain. If you got this, that the bow weevils, la da da. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were, I mean, your whole life, every day, was on what the weather is going to be. Um, okay. If if it's same thing, um, yeah. and uh, um, you borrow the money to make the crop, and then if you don't, but if you have a bumper crop, you know, happy times are here again. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's all a risk. Yep. Life is a risk. Yep. My, my cousins still, you know, have row crops and, uh, and cattle in, up in Kansas. You know, they're watching. They know everything there is to know about the rain and how much water they've gotten and, you know, what the markets are doing and all that. It's all risk. It's no. all risk. Right. So he's telling us, don't, don't look at this absurd world, this vain world, it's in rebellion against the creator and go home and, and just go in the bed and pull your head over, your covers over your head, okay? In faith, you gotta live and you gotta take risks and you gotta take the opportunities <coughs> that God puts in front of you. That's part of enjoying life. That's part of, of living out our lot. So let's look, now he's gonna talk about risk and we talked, and Sadie made this point last week about diversification. So look at verse two. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. Right? Do I put all my grain on one ship? No, I divide it over multiple ships, right? And so if you've had any your financial dealings, you don't just put it all in one spot, you wanna spread it out because these different markets have different risks. One's going up, one's going down, and all that kind of stuff. So he, he's, he's continuing to talk about managing risk wisely, like he did last week. Uh, divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune will occur on the earth. Hasn't he told us through the whole book 
You're not in control of your life. This absurd vain world has got all kinds of things going on and you can't control. And God in his providence is, providence is managing all this, but he doesn't tell us how he's managing it always, usually, right? Doesn't tell us what's going to happen tomorrow or how he's going to handle this or whatever. So you don't get to see that part of the picture. So manage the risk. Don't we do this? I mean, don't you do this every day? Right? Manage your risk. You don't put it all in, you know, what, um, what's the George Strait song? You gotta have an ace in the hole. No. Don't put it all on one bet. You know, I think he's got a line in the songs that don't put it all on the line with one bet or something like that. So that's so that's where George got this. He, he, he was reading Ecclesiastes. He was reading Ecclesiastes. All right. So let's look at let's look at verse three. Let's look at verse three. What's verse three telling us? If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls toward the south or the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. What's he telling us? Whatever will be, will be. <laughs> That's another song. That is well, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you got to know the environment that you're uh, that you're acting in. That's what he, that's what he's saying here. Uh, the people you talk about the farmers watching the clouds. The clouds are full. That means it's going to rain, right? If the, if there's a front coming in from the northwest and things are looking dark and blue. Well, guess what? There might be a storm tonight, right? So you got to you got to be able to read your environment. Another theme we talked about through the book: godly wisdom is knowing the word of God, but it's also knowing the situation and how to apply the word of God to live wisely. So that's what he's saying. You got to know you got to know the situation that you're making the investment in. Right. Um, I did want to mention generosity here uh, a little more. Um, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6. Uh, keep your finger here and flip back there. This is where Paul is talking about proportional giving. 2 Corinthians. But he's, he's making some of these same points in, uh, in the, over here in the New Testament. Now this I say, you guys know this scripture. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. If you don't swing, you can't hit the ball. And if he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. And then he goes on to talk about uh, you know giving here. But the point's the same. If you don't take risk, you can't profit. So it's it's a, it's the same thing here. Um, but it's also that's what you that's what generosity is, right? Generosity is taking a risk that I can share what I've been given, and God's going to provide for me as I do it. To not be generous is to basically go home and pull the covers over your head, right? I can't count on God to, you know, to, to provide for me if I give. So do, when you give a gift to somebody, you know, let, let's just pick missions, for, some, for example. Do all missionaries last on the mission field? Mm -hmm. I think the average time is about three years. Uh, when, when we were in another church in another state, you know, there were a couple missionaries that went out and um, they had problems in the field. And a couple of them didn't last more than a year or so. It's tough. So even for the kingdom, taking risks for the kingdom, it's not always going to work. When the you know, when you, I'm using missionaries as an example. And, I, and I'm not saying don't endorse and, and support missionaries. I'm just saying some of them fail and some of them succeed, you know, even in God's kingdom. So generosity is trusting God that he's going to provide even when the ship sinks, so to speak. 
you know, uh, when, you, when you've given money to people, did they always use it well? No. 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 Resounding no on that one. Okay. Okay. But do you still give money to people that you think need it? Yeah. So cast your bread on the waters, right? Because you can't always tell uh, which, which ship's coming in and how long it's going to take. All right, so verse 3 is talking about you, you know, being wise and fearing the Lord doesn't mean you just frivolously make a, take a risk. You know the environment that you're taking the risk in, right? You, you, you know, I'll just use stocks because we're talking about finances. You know, you read the brochures and you learn about the company before you buy any of the stock, right? You, and you understand what they're trying to sell and what their market is and that sort of thing. So you understand the environment that you're, you know, the situation that you're making the, the financial risk in. Okay, that's what he's talking about. The, where, the tree falls where it falls, right? So number four, verse four. He who watches the wind will not sow. He who looks at the clouds will not reap. Does that bring anybody to mind that you might have met? Some people procrastinate, and they never get to the end zone. Yeah, there's always a reason. Uh -huh. There's always a reason. Uh, you know, we'll go back to the farm. Well, the it's the the, the field's just too wet. It rained last night, and my tractor's going to get stuck, and I can't get my my seed in today. And tomorrow it's going to be too hot. And tomorrow my you know well my tractor broke down. You know, or the, you know, overthink anything. There's always some reason not to take the risk. And I, I didn't put it on your notes here, but a couple of my favorite proverbs is the one where he says, um, he said, there's a, there's a fool, the fool says there's a lion in the street. There's a lion out there. I can't go out there. I got to, I got to hide in here and be safe. I can't take a risk. There's always a lion out there or a tiger or a bear or something that's going to get me. If, if I take a risk. Um, the other one I love, that I think of my kids when they were teenagers, the fool um, sees what has to be done and then rolls over in his bed like a, like a hinge. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the proverb. I should, have, I should have written it down. But there's always a, people who will always have a reason not to do something. Well, we can turn that to witnessing or to anything. Oh, we don't mind doing that. Oh, I should talk to that person. Well, maybe next week. Uh, maybe I'm not the one that should talk to them. Not the one. Yeah. It can be, it can be witnessing. It, it can, can be, be giving. Yeah. Well, so, you know, the church wants to have a building problem. Well, I don't know about that. You know, do we really need a building program? Our buildings look pretty good to me. You know, there's always a reason not to take a risk. That's what he's saying here. There's always going to be a reason. Uh, he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Well, I can't, I can't get out there and paint that spot because it looks like it's going to rain. You know, and that paint, it's got to have. You know, it's got to be really sunny to dry. You know, I better wait. I better, I'll just put that off for tomorrow, right? What's he talking about then? <laughs> Manana, right? Manana. I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow or something, right? So he's counseling us to seize the moment. There's, and rec you know, recognize we all have to fight this. There's always some reason not to do something. So when God puts something in front of you, Maybe it's a financial investment. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's, um, uh, you know, uh, when Daniel called me in December and said, "I want, I need somebody to uh, do a let, you know, do a, a, a study, you know, for the spring." Okay, when God puts these things in front of you, yeah, there's always a reason you can come up with and say, you know, maybe somebody else would do better, or I'm busy, or, or uh, maybe next year or something like that. Not me. Seize the moment. You don't know if you're going to have next year. You don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. That's been one of the themes of the book. You don't know that. You don't know that. So he's saying seize the moment. 
All right, so we know everybody about verse 4. And this, in verse 5, he's going to kind of sum up what he said several times before already in the book. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Okay, these things happen around us all the time, right? The wind blows. We don't know really who steers it. We don't know why it goes. The weather people are getting pretty good at being able to predict it with the model with the satellites and computers and stuff. But it's still a mystery when you're out there and the wind's blowing or the mystery of life being created in the womb of a woman and bones being formed in a child. That's a miracle. But can any of us explain it very well? So that's, he's been telling us this all through the book. God's providences are beyond our understanding. So you do not know the activity of God who makes all. We don't know when God's put this opportunity in front of you. You don't know the good the investment that's going to come back from that. It may even be beyond your lifetime. Okay, And you, you hear these testimonies, right? Well, somebody said a word to me that steered my life in a certain direction for good. Somebody gave me an encouraging word. Somebody supported me when I was down or needed help. Well, who's, who's God put in front of you to make those investments with? That's part of your homework, is to think about what, what is, has God put in front of you to invest time or money or expertise or relationship in. So, so think about that because we don't know, we don't have tomorrow necessarily, and we don't know how God's going to use those things. And they're not all successful. And they're not all going to work. You're right? Uh, you're going to, you know, maybe you're going to give some people some money for school or something, and they still drop out, or they never finish what the the direction they set off. Or your kids, right? That, that could be a story too, right? Yeah, big story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you don't know the activity who makes all things. The activity of God who makes all things. We can't, this is back to what he told Job. Were you there when I did the creation? You don't know how I, how I did those things. And you don't know how it's all going to turn out. All right. Um, First, uh, I wanted to look at, at Psalm uh, 139, 13. Kind of says the same thing here. Again, I'm going to continually pull you back to the Psalms and the Proverbs to show you the connection with Ecclesiastes. 139, uh, 13. And this, this is kind of, I think, what he's alluding to in this, in, when he's talking about bones being formed. He's alluding to this psalm. For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. So Solomon's the preacher. He's alluding to this psalm when he's, when he's talking about the, uh, God's providence here. And using that as, a, as an example, how babies form. We can't tell these things. They're beyond our understanding. Um, so, uh, and I gave you a, a, a couple references here. We can't know or, uh, or understand our, everything. Ecclesiastes 117, he said that in the front of the book. We can't predict the future, but we can know the seasons. Remember he told us that there's a time for, to die, there's a time to be born. Ecclesiastes 3. So he's, he's hit that again. So we have to live and act in faith. And the key word is today. Uh, Proverbs 29.25. I'm not going to read all these, but a couple of them I want to hit here. 29.25. The fear of man, right? Another reason to put something off. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord... Maybe will be exalted. 
right? How often do we put stuff off because we're afraid of what somebody's going to say or do or, you know, feather that might get ruffled, right? How many times do you see in Scripture where, uh, you know, particularly Paul in the New Testament, where he did something and everybody clapped? No, they were half, half, most of the crowd was trying to kill him or run him out of town or throw rocks at him, right? <laughs> right? So, so uh, you know, what people say is not always a good reason to put things off. Deuteronomy 31 8. And the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you, He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. What a promise. When we're talking about taking risk and God's promise that he's already gone ahead of us, uh, but this is a statement of God's providence, of his care and his providence. Do not fear or be dismayed. When you've prayed and God says, take this opportunity, and God says he's already gone before you. Isn't that an encouragement? Yes. Um, and finally, um, Matthew 25, and this is the uh, all of that sermon. Matthew 25, 22 to 26. Okay, this is when Jesus is given the parable about the servants, and they've each been given a, a, a certain amount of money. Okay, now the owner, you know, now the owner comes back. Okay, and, and he's talking to the third servant. And I was afraid and, and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. He pulled, he pulled the covers over his head, right? I'm afraid it's, it, the world's too weird. The world's too absurd. I'm not going to invest the money. I'm not going to take the moment. I'm not going to seize the moment. But what's the master going to tell me? Does he commend him? It's a bad day. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. Low risk. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, I never understood this verse before um, until you look at it as a through a financial lens. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. He's making, the master's making a financial decision. Give the money to the guy who's going to get a return for me on the money. Not only the return, the best return. The best return, yeah. Don't hide my money in the dirt. Mm -hmm. At least go put it in the bank. And so you're fired. You're fired. And I'm going to give that money to somebody who knows how to invest it. Because he had two of the guys that got, that got good returns, but one did better than the other. Yeah. So the difference, the two guys took risk. They each took risk. This guy didn't want to take the risk, didn't use the investment and the opportunity that God gave him, and he's, he's going to lose out because of it. Okay? So it's another way here. Back to this point. If God's giving you something to use as part of your lot, maybe maybe financial resources or time or expertise or relationship, seize the moment. Don't be the third servant and just go home and pull the covers over your head because the world's too weird. Okay, so I wanted to read through those. So the point here is use your time, talents, resources wisely. Recognize that it's not always going to work. And, um, and we've talked about this a little bit as part of your lot in life. Look at Proverbs 37, uh, uh, Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 37. This is a great psalm. They're all great psalms, but this one really speaks to me. Um, Psalm 37, we don't know how God always does things, right? He said, you know, his provinces are beyond our understanding. But one of his tools is to put a desire on your heart to do something, to do something. 
So um, I'll start at verse 3. Um, Trust in the Lord and do good. Okay, so there's a command to do something. Don't hide the bed. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Cultivating means work, means taking risk. Delight your, verse 4, here's the key verse. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So these opportunities that he comes sliding by you, most of the times he has put desires in your heart to match that opportunity. He gave me a desire to teach his word. Well, Daniel calls me up and said, I need a teacher. Well, huh, how did that happen? How did that happen? Okay, because God works on your heart and prepares your heart for the investments that he wants you to make, for the opportunities that he wants you to seize. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. Okay. He will do it. In his providence, he not only controls the opportunities as part of your lot, he controls your heart and develops your heart and your skills and your ability and your resources to be able to do this. Think about 1 Corinthians 12, where which I'm not going to take us there, but 1 Corinthians 12 is about the gifts of the Spirit. Right? There's gifts for teaching, there's gifts for preaching, there's gifts of administration, on and on and on and on. So don't you think if he's given you those gifts of, of the Spirit to work in his kingdom, don't you think he's going to bring opportunities in front of you? Okay, so if you've got a gift of administration, guess what? Doesn't he have a need for administering his church? If you've got gifts of ministering to people, uh, particularly I think about comfort, right? you know, people who are uh, in mourning or things like this, don't you think he's going to bring you in front, bring those people to you? Seize the moment. Seize the moment. It's not. It's not for. It's not by accident. That's what. He, that's what verse five was about there. We don't know the activities of God and how he does these things, but he does them, right? He does them. Does it always mean they're going to work? Does it always mean it's going to be easy? Right? We always want convenience, right? We, well, A equals B and everything fits and everything's easy and it happens easy and fast and voila. Um, the first... Uh, in church history, some of you guys, know, you're taking per, uh, perspectives or history of missions and all that. You guys know who William Carey was? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, he demanded basically to go off as a missionary and had to get a, a, you know, finally get the right churches to send him off. Well, he goes to India. His first factory burns down. His wife goes mad. Um... The British come in and um, they really don't want him to, miss, uh, to minister the gospel. They want him because he knows all the languages and he can. And they need to know the languages and to run the empire. And that's how the Bible gets translated into these dialects in India. Uh, but this happens. This you know he's got. If you read his story, it's amazing. It's ups and downs, ups and downs over 25, 30 years, a whole lifetime. Okay. It wasn't easy, but he sees the opportunity that God had put in front of him. The guy was a cobbler. He fixed shoes, but he got a map of the world and hung it on the wall over his workbench and prayed over it every day. And that's how God develops him as a missionary. So I just, that's, you know, there's all these stories like this. But what is God putting in front of you? That's the question tonight. You know, it concerns me sometimes, as old as I am, that what God may have put in front of me and I missed it. 
And when I get to heaven, I know he won't say this, but I think, well, I wanted to do so much more with you, but you didn't. He, the things I put before you, and uh, that concerns me sometimes that uh, I'm not aware maybe of what some things he wanted me to do or the people he wanted me to come in contact with, and I, I know it. Yeah, we don't want to be that third servant. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. bury, bury the uh, talent, right? Yeah. Well, I'll send you my angel with the ball bat <laughs> to wake you up and remind you. Okay? <laughs> But that's something to pray about, is to yeah, not yeah. miss, not yeah. miss the opportunity, right? You know, don't, I mean, you've had those people come up to you and said, you know, I invested in this stock when it was really cheap, you know, and now it's, you know, I've made a fortune off of this one investment because they didn't, I didn't miss the investment. And you said, well, why didn't you, you know, you, you run into these people, you know, I, I made the killing on this stock and well, why didn't you invest at that time? Okay, but that's that's the idea here. Don't miss the opportunity God's given you. We uh, buried a friend of Port Sam on Monday <clears throat> that we played bridge with, and um, his wife asked me if I would come over and have lunch with her yesterday because she had all this food left over. So I called her and I said, "I'm really hungry. I'm coming." So. We talked and talked and talked, but mostly I wanted to know about her. Because when you play bridge, you don't really get to under know personally. So I got to know her pretty good. She gave me like her whole life, uh, her life's history. And um, I finally said to her, I said, have you ever accepted Jesus as your Savior? And she said, well, I've been a really good Catholic all these years. And that's how she looked at me. She looked at me like, are you my friend or are you not my friend? And that's the first time I felt like she's not going to call me to come over anymore. And, um, but I'm just praying that the Lord used that because before, her husband died, she had cancer, and so when we got to play bridge one time, she was really hurt and upset, and so I put my arm around her, and I prayed for her right then, and she said, nobody ever does that, and um, I don't know why I do it either, but I mean, it just, <coughs> the spur of the moment, she's upset, and I know how to talk to the Lord. So, um, anyway, when you're saying seize the moment, sometimes you can get scared and think, maybe I shouldn't say anything to her. Mm -hmm. But I did. I did ask her if she ever accepted. And I don't know if she even knew what I was talking about. Because sometimes I think we use terminology that they don't understand, but that should be easy, shouldn't it? Well, Have you ever accepted Christ or Jesus as your Savior? Um, so I'm sure she thinks she has. Yeah. Well, th thanks for that story. But basically the idea is being bold enough to witness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The only thing I'd, I'd suggest here, if, you know, to the degree you can, try to get them to Scripture. Let Scripture talk, do the talking. And, and they may not understand that either at first. I surely didn't at first, but... God will start using his word. Mm -hmm. if, so if you can involve scripture in your witness, uh, that's what makes help make the investment, if you will. Yeah. That sees the moment. That's that's the point here. To live boldly in these desires that God gives us. I wanted to take you to Caleb. Uh, uh, Joshua 15. And if you know the story of Caleb. Uh, so they, you know, he and Caleb were the only two of the 12 when they got sent in as spies to the land. This is in Numbers 13. And Moses says, go in and spy out the land, right? Ten of them come back and say, 
you know, all this is it's bumper crops, but there are giants in the land, and we're too little. I, we can't we can't do it. And Caleb and Joshua scream and holler, saying, "No, we need to go in. We need to go in. We need to go in. We need to go in." And then the whole nation turns against them and spends the next forty years in the desert, tromping around uh, when they had the opportunity. Seize the opportunity, seize the moment God had put in front of them. Well, so that you guys know the story, 40 years goes by. The nation finally, uh, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies, first part of Joshua. Joshua is going to lead the nation and they're going to go into Canaan and seize the land. Well, they get through, they, you know, they spend years fighting the, you know, the various pagan tribes that are in Canaan. So they get the end of the end of the deal, and they're going to divvy the land up among the tribes. When the spies went in, one of the places where they saw the giants was in Hebron, was present day Hebron. Read this, um, Joshua fifteen. So they get ready to. Divvy the land up, Joshua 15, 13. Now he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriath Arba, Hebrew. Uh, in verse 14, And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, these are the giants by name. And he gives the names there, the children of Anak. Now, Goliath is descended from these guys. And we see Goliath meet up with David later. He's descended from these guys, okay? These pagan guys. So Caleb, by this time, is in his 80s. Eighties. And he's waited 40 years. <laughs> to get his hands on these giants. Think about that. Think about that. The desire of the heart that God had given this man, and at age 80, he was, he was chomping at the bit to get a hold of these giants when they finally got in the land. Okay? Seize the moment. He had to wait 40 years for it, but when he got it, he seized it because he said he did business with these giants here. Right? So maybe if God's given you a desire, an unfulfilled desire, maybe from years from before, and you didn't have the opportunity to, to do anything about it. Again, I go back to the William Carey example. It was years before he had to, before he finally gets to India. I mean, he has to go through all these problems and everything. Is there anything, an unfulfilled desire that God's given you? Maybe even from your youth, that's not finished business. I just ask you to think about that this week. Maybe talking to somebody, maybe going on a mission trip, maybe doing something in church, uh, maybe giving something to somebody. I don't know what it could be, but ask the Lord, is there unfinished business? Like Caleb, that I need to finish. Because I don't know if I got tomorrow. That's why we're Caleb saying, Lord, I'm running out of time. And the giants aren't getting any smaller. Yeah. Right? So let me add. So uh, act for today, for your time is short. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 7 to 10. <laughs> Now he's told us all the way along, uh, this, is the, this is your question. What's the act of faith? How should we live in this absurd, vain world? What's, how, what's the act of faith? Come on. We better, we've hit it almost every week. Enjoy life. All right. What's he going to tell us again tonight? Enjoy life. The light is pleasant, and it's good for the eyes to see the sun. 
Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all, and let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. Time, your time is short. Everything that is to come will be fertility. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Did we just talk about desires that God gives you? Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. <laughs> I, was, um, you know, I was watching our grandkids do sports and stuff and I was thinking, I guess I could do that at one time, but if I tried it today, I'd be in bed for a week probably, you know. <laughs> Um, the prime of life is are fleeting. <laughs> the point here is act while you've got the moment. We don't know what our health is going to be tomorrow. Uh, we can't predict that. Uh, in Hebrews 11, 7 to 8, I'm going to take you there. That's the Hall of Faith, Hall of Fame of Faith. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11. And I want you to read what he says about Abraham and Noah and basically how they seize the moment. Uh, 11, verse 7 to 8. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen. You think, you think God gave Noah a desire in his heart? Imagine if he took 120 years to build an ark. In reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Aren't you glad that Noah didn't roll over and said, you know, it's kind of cloudy out there. Maybe I'll just hold off on that boat. Right? Verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance and he went out, not knowing where he was going. God didn't even give him, tell him where he was going. He just said, go. And he went. You know, don't we all, you know, we want a, we want a road map. We want a timeline. We want a backpack. We want a, 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 a you know, a, 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 a emergency phone line. We want all, all these things uh, to make things comfortable for us and safe for us. These guys didn't have comfort. They didn't have safety. And that's why they're commended for their faith, because they seized the moment that God gave them, put in front of them. Um, this passage in Ecclesiastes, uh, we talked about how Jesus was going to hold his servants accountable. Well, he says it here again. Um, Follow the impulses of your heart, the size of your eye, know that God will bring you into judgment for all these things. Remember that at the start of the book, and he's going down all these paths of pleasure, and he's seeking out all these things, trying to find out what satisfies his soul. And the premise was there is no tomorrow, and there's nothing after tomorrow. Look where he's gotten to by the end of the book, where he's taking you to the end of the book. There is an after tomorrow. There is judgment. There is accountability. And that's part, that's, that's how God gives us purpose in life. If there's no judgment, if it's just an annihilation and poof, we're gone, live for tomorrow, live it up. But truth is, there is judgment. There is a day after tomorrow. There is a day after death. And you're going to be held accountable. Right? Where does that take you? Enjoy life. And part of enjoying life is taking the risk that God puts in front of you. The seize in the moment. It's not hiding off in a cave. Um, uh, back to 2 Corinthians. And we'll wrap up here. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about the Bema judgment. And, and Paul's telling the Corinthians, you know, you're going to be held accountable for how you live in the kingdom. 
verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Just like Jesus said in the, in the parable, right? Whether good or bad. So judgment, we hear judgment and we immediately think of bad things, right? Judgment is rewards as well as chastisement, right? Think about what Jesus talked about with the three characters, right? The two of them, the two servants make good choices, good investments, good returns. They get commended and they get rewarded with more things to invest and do. It's the third guy that has the problem. He didn't seize the moment. He ran and hid. And he's chastised for it. And he loses his reward. His reward's given to the other people to go off and make investments with. Right? That's what he's, that's what Saul the, the preacher is saying to us here. We're going to be held accountable. That's rewards as well as chastisement for our behavior in the kingdom. So the upshot tonight sees the moment. Now, if, if there's anybody here that has not received Christ, Jesus calls everybody to himself. Tonight's the night. Seize the moment. Because you don't know if you got tomorrow. Seize the moment. Um, so we've already talked about these other questions. These are for you to think about in your quiet time this week. What opportunities are before you today? And how are you acting on them? And I'd particularly ask you to think about generosity. God's been working on me about generosity in about the last several months. Uh, about what, well, longer than that, but learning to be more generous. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a, a risk-taking thing, right? Being more generous. Um, but that you might think about that. How can I be more generous with my time or my money or my expertise or in building a relationship with somebody. What are you doing to manage risk? We talked about this last week, right? Uh, what risks are in front of you tonight and how would you manage them wisely? And then the last one, we've hit this one. Uh, this is your Caleb question. What, what have you put off or couldn't do that you need to do before you can? You come up. Why do you have that question? Because I want I want you to think prayerfully about this stuff this week. I mean, God doesn't, God doesn't give us his word. It's not, God's word is not benign. It doesn't just sit there. And we don't get to just sit there under the hearing of his word. It for, God's word drives you to action of some kind. Repentance, obedience, uh, you know, whatever it is. But pray over these questions this week. Is there something undone that you need to go do before you can't do it. We'll pray over that this week. Any other Anybody thing? needs a guardian angel with a ball bat, I'll give them mine. <laughs> guardian angel with a ball enough. bat, yeah. Well, that angel, that angel, right, he, he can uh, he can drive us to action, right? He can drive us to do things. But are there any any things you don't want, you need to get done before you die. It's part of your life. But is there something you need to go do or invest in or give or tell somebody or whatever it is before you can? Anything else tonight? Hopefully this is starting to juice a little bit. Anything else tonight? I've been told that um, success is at the intersection of preparation and opportunity. Seize the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but preparation 
so the, 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 for the people on the tape, success being the idea of being between opportunity and preparation, right? It's where they cross, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the upshot of, of the, these questions is what has God put in front of you that you know, he's prepared you to do? Caleb was prepared for all those years to go do business with the giants. What's God prepared you to do that he needs done? He's given you a desire to go do it. So, all right, next, this next week, uh, we're going to wrap up. So please read chapter 12. That's the last book. It's short. It's one of the most famous sections of Ecclesiastes. You're probably very familiar with it. Um, so it, it, it's going to, again, kind of pound on this, this idea that life is short. And I, I was going to title the lesson for that. The first part is you can't beat the clock. Uh, we're going to age in the end, you know, and it talks about aging. And then the last part of the book is the bookend, the conclusion part, where Solomon says, fear the Lord, and wraps the book up. So we're going to cram all that together, and then we're going to talk about the, the themes of, of the book that we covered as we went through the book. So, and then we'll wrap up the, the course next week. Any questions? All right, well, let's close. Great Lord, we praise you tonight and thank you for how you do prepare us and you give us desires that you have seated in our hearts and minds and you put these opportunities in front of us. Give us the boldness to live faithfully. Give us grace, Lord, to be like Caleb and not like the, the, uh, the unfaithful servant. Help us to seize the moment in obedience and faith, Lord, to your honor and glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Madrid. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, yeah. Bible study are you working on the neighbors? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to... I've been enlisted to help please uh, study about grandparenting in the fall. We're going to do a uh, we're going to do a series on intentional grandparenting. Intentional. Being a better, a more intentional grandparent. In what is that great? Well, that that would qualify. That would qualify. <laughs>